Well, good morning. Welcome to worship. I'm going to attempt to preach sitting down today. We'll see. It's a difficulty factor of 10, so I don't know uh, if I can do it. I mean, you know, I can uh, barely contain my excitement. Anyway, it's good to be in Good to be back in the crossing. Many of you know I was over in Israel for a couple of weeks, and that was a lot of fun. I'll share more about that in, in the message, but I'm so glad you're here today. It's great. You know, we, we see people coming back more and more, coming back into our live worship, and we're so happy to see you, and we're so thankful for those online. You know, we have uh, as many and more who are watching online than are in the building. It is amazing. So we, uh, and that's just in the day, in, in the Sunday, and after that it grows exponentially. But we're really thankful for our online community, for those who are in the building, we're just very thankful for all of you. And we're in a series right now on vision. We were uh, looking at what to do during uh, the remainder of the summer, and George had a great idea. He said, you know, I think we should just refocus the church back on our vision, and we should take time to really break it down really explain to everyone, you know, what we're about, uh, where we're going, what God's doing among us. So we're going to be doing that for the next uh, four weeks. And then in, uh, in September, uh, we're going to begin a series called Holy Moses. <laughs> How to become a friend of God. I've always wanted to do this series. <laughs> anyway, so I'll be doing the first three messages of that. But that's going to be a lot of fun, and we're going to look, look forward to that. But we're looking at this whole... Uh, issue of vision and what God's really called us to do. And today, I want to begin this message by asking you a question about where you are right now, because it's very important for a vision, very important for your spiritual growth, for your life. On a scale of one to 10, how would you rate your relationship with God right now? I mean, right now. Now, I don't want to ask that question. There's going to be like a wide variety of responses you know, ten's the highest, one's the lowest. And think about where you really are in, in your journey. Look, if you're like at a 10 or 11, I want to encourage you to keep going. But if you're at a place in your life where there was a time when you were higher on that scale, and you can look back and say, you know, back when I was hearing from God, I was consistent in my time with God. I was given. I was serving. I was really in a great spot. But I'm not there now. I want you to really listen to what I'm sharing with you because it's time to make some adjustments in your life. You want to begin to reclaim what God wants to do inside of you in terms of your relationship with him. It is the key to everything. You know, uh, I was been really struck by this. I've been doing some studying on some other, other matters, and, and I came across this idea that just struck me, and it fits so much the message today. You know, Jesus, when he taught his disciples and challenged them and challenged the crowd, he talked about this great commandment, this great commandment we have to live into. And in Matthew 22, He's responding to what is the greatest commandment. He talks about loving the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And it, this, this element of being fully committed is like a, a cornerstone of our faith. And if you know anything about the scripture, you realize it's not a new idea. You realize that this is what Moses taught. When he quotes this, he's quoting from Deuteronomy chapter 6, and he's quoting from a prayer that's prayed twice a day. It's like he's, he's emphasizing something that's so significant to our journey. So maybe you know that already. You know this is the element of it. And we looked at it as we began to look at vision for this church and what God's called us into and our walk with God. We began to pray about what God wanted us to be as a church. We knew we had a camp right here. We said, what does Jesus say we should be? That joining a church shouldn't be simply about joining an organization. It should be about a walk with God. That the most important thing is to say, I want to be a part of people who wants to love God with all of my being. That's what I really want. That's what I long for. So that's really where we began, you know, our mission statement, like found in Matthew chapter 22. And 
You know, we talk about igniting hearts, changing lives, impacting the world, how we summarize it. But the full statement is to raise up children, youth, and adults who will love God with their whole being. There it is. Who will love God with their whole being. Whose lives and relationships will reflect Christ's character and are empowered by the Holy Spirit to change the world. That is our mission. And the first part of it is what we see here in Matthew 22. Now, so in my study, as I'm looking at this, I'm pressing more into the meaning of this. And I came across an insight i got to pass along with you. It's not in the verses. You're going to find the screen. But if you were to page back through Deuteronomy and you were to see Moses giving these instructions, you discover these instructions are given as they're camped on the other side of the Jordan. They're about to enter the promised land. There will be a, few, a little bit of time, but they're about to enter it when Moses is gone, and they're about to enter into that promise. And he states these commands that this has to be your priority, to love the Lord your God with your heart, soul, mind. Of course, someone's at strength, right? To, to love God with the whole being. What you may not know is how significant this is in every stage of the Scripture in every stage of God's people's lives. These were people who came out of Egypt, and they had learned to uh, depend upon the River Nile for their lives, for the water they needed, the irrigation for their crops. But now they're about to embark into a new land. And if you know anything about the land of Israel, and having spent some time there uh, recently, I can tell you it was 104 degrees where I was, 104. And when you're in that in that area you can see how desolate it can be. I remember driving through Jericho one night at five o'clock. It was a hundred and nine at five o'clock at night. And you can see just how difficult the terrain is. And if you know anything about the about Israel, you realize you have the Jordan River, it's a very small river, it comes out of Mount Hermon and then uh, the headwaters are at Caesarea Philippi and then flows down to the Sea of Galilee and then then eventually down the Jordan River and it goes again and it goes to the Dead Sea. And that water is a key part of water supply in Israel, even to this day, even though they have other means now that they're using uh, for water. But this is a key, a key element. And in the ancient world, there was no way to take the water out of the Sea of Galilee or the Jordan River and begin to, to irrigate other parts of the, of the country. It's not going to happen. In fact, the Jordan River, the Sea of Galilee sits below sea level. It's, it's a challenge, right? So that's not going to happen. And that meant this. They had to now depend upon the rain, that God would send rain to nurture them. And God promised, if you put me first in your life, if you put me first, I will cause blessing to rain down upon you. When the promise was said that he is sending them into a land of milk and honey, you ever wonder what that means? It means that your livestock will flourish. That's the milk. And of course, your crops will flourish. That's the honey. I will bless you. This word, we, we find it in Deuteronomy. As they're about to enter the land, they, they shouldn't depend upon what the culture is saying. They shouldn't depend upon the, the gods, the, the Balaams. They shouldn't depend upon the gods of the, of the land. They should depend upon the God. They should depend upon God alone. And all through history, this becomes the issue of God's people, that somehow they're prone to compromise their faith, to lose their spiritual passion, to lose their priorities, and that becomes a story of the Old Testament. And finally, in the days of Jesus, when Matthew 22, if you know the story, Jesus quotes this, but he comes into Jerusalem, he rides into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, and then all these spiritual leaders begin to challenge him, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, all the, the scribes, they begin, one after one, begin to come up to him, and he begins to knock down every single argument and shows how supreme and how powerful, how full of wisdom he is. And he makes this statement and reminds them again in this moment, in this time of Roman oppression, in this time of difficulty in this land, remember the greatest commandment. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the blessings of God will flow. 
that's what we believe God's called us to. And we're going to see in a text today, the same theme is woven in a different context. It's not the context of the Exodus as found in the book of Deuteronomy, in Deuteronomy 6. It's not the, the context of Matthew 22 and Jesus challenging the authorities in Jerusalem. Again, primarily Jewish audiences. As now it'll be in Ephesus. Probably a Gentile audience where they have to understand and understand and know about loving God first. That they should never lose that priority in their lives. So today we're going to look at that. It's living in ways that brings glory to God and learning how to walk in ways that God uh, really wants to use us and help us on our journey. And today we're going to look at this idea of of how putting him first, to how we can do that, how we can live into things. Here's how I'm going to break it down. I'm going to read the text in a moment. I want to read a passage out of Revelation uh, chapter 2, and I'll give you some context of that. And I want to break it down for you. And what I want to share with you are three steps that we can take to preserve our walk with God. And what I want you to hear is that these steps, are you, it's not a, a one-off. It's not like you check the list and you're done. This is process God will place you in in every season of your life so you want to learn the lessons here I'm about to share with you and our prayer is you'll take them you'll use them and as we finish this day we'll that God will call us all into this place where we're saying yes this is what I signed up for I want God to be first in my life above everything else I want to love him with my entire being that's really what I long for Here's what I've learned. <clears throat> Hear me. In every generation here, uh, young to old, I was just, <laughs> listen to this. So this archaeologist, our final day in the dig, he says, he says, we've had here on this dig in these last two weeks, people from the very young to the very old. And I realized I was the oldest, one of the oldest. <laughs> There's one man, one year older than me, and, and I, I most raised my hand because uh, I, when an archaeologist calls you very old, <laughs> I just want you to know I've crossed over. I, I thought I've already owned old. It's the word very that, <laughs> that bothers me. <laughs> just the thought. Anyway, so I'm going to share <laughs> some things with you. And my prayer is that, that it will help you in your journey and it will be a blessing to you. So let's let it get started. Let me read Revelation uh, 2. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write. Now we're going to break down this church here. We're going to see a 40-year history. We're about to see a 40-year history. What we're going to see is this. Something you'll learn to learn in your life. Sometimes the battles we face in our life are the battles we face for a lifetime. Some of you know it's true. You're still fighting things you dealt with. You thought you put to bed 10 years ago, but you did. It's still a recurring issue. These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, which are the seven angels, and walks among the seven golden lampstands, which is, are the seven churches. I know your deeds. And I know your hard work and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles, but they are not, and found them to be false. You have persevered, you've endured hardship for my name, and have not grown weary. Yet I hold this against you. You've forsaken your first love. There it is. You've forsaken your first love. Remember the height from which you've fallen. Repent and do the things to did first. If you don't repent, I'll come to you and remove the lampstand from its place. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practice of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him overcomes, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Now, this is one of the more famous uh, passages in Scripture, and it's, it's, it's certainly one that calls us this idea of first love and reclaiming this idea that what Jesus talk about, talks about. 
And it tells us that in our life, we are prone to drift. We are prone to wander. And God looks to call us back into this relationship with him. That it's all about closeness, intimacy with him. And that's where we as a church, that's where our focus is. It's on cultivating that in all of our lives. That is where it begins, igniting hearts. People who will love God with their whole being. That is the focus of our children's program, our youth program, and our adult program. To call people into that relationship. It's not about what we want. It's not about our agenda. It's not about my selfish needs. It's about God's agenda. It's not about, I used to tell pastors years ago, it's not about like coming to church and saying, oh, I like that, didn't like that. It's about coming to church and leaving and saying, did God like that or not? Different agenda. It's a whole different way of doing church. So if we're going to grow in this, what do we have to do? And I think the first thing we need to grow in that element of love with God is we have to put a filter over our heart. We have to learn to guard our hearts. And if you read through these first three verses, you see it's the case. The, the intro words in the beginning write about uh, the words that are written to, to the, uh, the angel of these, of these churches. And then in verse 2, I know your deeds, your hard work, your perseverance. We, we see what's involved in this. And we get a picture of what's happening. That Jesus is involved and knows everything going on in the lives of his people. The, I love the image of Jesus just walking around the church and just inspecting everything. Think about it. He's walking around the aisles here this morning. He knows what's happening in our hearts. If we're engaged with him, if we're not. If we're worshiping, honoring him or not. I love the idea of an angel over a church, don't you? I love this idea. But the idea is he's always present. He knows where his church is. He knows what his church needs. And when you start thinking about that, it gets really convicting. It's like, you know, wow, am I just going through the motions? Am I just having church to have church? Am I really coming to meet God? Am I really coming for that's my, my purpose? And you start looking at it that, that this is the priority. And when Jesus looks, he sees things he likes. I mean, he goes to the, the Ephesian church, and, and it's been a church of history. Maybe you've, if you've been a student of the Bible, you know the church at Ephesus is like, hey, it's a famous church. But it wasn't perfect. It just wasn't perfect. And no church is. But he sees some things, and he likes what he sees. And he begins to affirm things in their life. And he sees something. He sees something about them. A willingness to address issues that aren't right, uh, a willingness to, to deal with the heart of some of their problems. To really put a filter over what is influencing them and, and what is uh, informing how they believe and what they believe. Now, if you were to go back, this book is written, let's say, in the 90s, Revelation. John, the apostle, the, the final living apostles, writing this so it's in the 90s. If we go to her back, when, when Paul was at Ephesus, we go back almost, we go back 40 years, a little over 40 years. And we find the story told in Acts chapter 19 of how this revival breaks out in Ephesus and how Paul entered the synagogue, spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively for the kingdom of God. It's not on the screen, by the way, but I'll read it to you. But some of them became obstinate and, obstinate, and they refused to... to believe, and they publicly maligned the way. So Paul left them, and he took the disciples with him and had daily discussions in the lecture hall of Tyrannus, which they have not, not found this. It could be an actual lecture hall, or it could be a, a part of a, a villa, one of these Roman villas that are sort of built in Ephesus. We're not quite sure exactly, but more than likely, they think it's a lecture hall, not part of a home. This went on for two years, so that all the Jews and the Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word. Now, the, word, the church begins to explode. It happens. The church in Colossae that begins, is formed. I mean, all the Hierapolis, all these churches are formed out of this tremendous two-year, two-and-a-half-year revival that happens in Ephesus. And it says that God did extraordinary miracles through Paul. 
so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that touched him were taken to the sick, and their illnesses were cured, and evil spirits left them. I mean, it was an amazing move of God. But there was a problem. Sometimes, you know, we look at moves of God, and they become like, a, a, like, like icing on a cake. It's sort of like it just covers up everything underneath. Like if the cake's not right, the cake's not right. You could put icing on it, but, you know, it's still not right. And so you got to look, something has to change. And so what happens is, this, this story unfolds, I'm going to read it to you. Some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon-possessed. And they would say, in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches, I command you, come out. Seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, was doing this. And one day, evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? <laughs> Then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them. He gave them to beating. They ran out the house naked and bleeding. And when this became known to the Jews and the Greeks living in the city, they were seized with a spirit of fear. And the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honor. Now, here's the phrase I want you to hear. Many of those who believed, who believed. Now, here's the idea. Are they new to belief? Probably not. These are existing believers who had stepped into renewal and revival, who had split loyalties in what they believed. Many of those who believed now came and openly confessed what they had done. A number of them who had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. And if you study Ephesus, you realize there was a blend of folk religion. These people kept their household gods. You can find these household gods, these magical incantations. And, it, and so they kept all these things. And it was, it was famous for these magical incantations. And the worship of Artemis, which was a, a key uh, uh, shrine in the city, people traveled all over the world to come to this a, a magnificent uh, facility. It was known for these magical incantations. And here were Christians saying, I follow Jesus, but I'm still doing the magic on the side. And finally they're going, this has got to go. They learned to put the filter on. They learned how to screen it out. And 40 years later, John is quoting Jesus saying, you did a good job. I mean, you're doing a good job. You've grown in so many areas of your life, and this is really one of them. You, you've really done that. And what they learned early on was this, is that learning to grow is not just about condemning what's wrong. It's learning how to build on what's right. And when you go in your life, you begin to build on what's right. So here at this church, we believe this. We believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. You hear us talk about signs and wonders, miracles, God does miracles. We believe in the power of the word. We believe the blending of those two things together are extremely powerful. And of course, in our Methodist tradition, we have believe in the power of tradition as well. Not on the same level as scripture, obviously. But it can, we can learn from the past. What we learn, though, are some characteristics about what it means to live in this, to filter out our life. And I want you to put it on your radar screen to understand how we, how we grow. We learn this passage, it requires hard work, perseverance, and a discerning spirit. That's how we grow. That's how this filter works in our life. Hard work is that first word, right? We, we see in... Uh, we see there, it's, you, you, you've really, you've, you've put hard work in, involved in this. You've done this. And this idea is, is that growing in God, it, it doesn't always come easily. I, you've heard me quote it before. I'm going to say it again. I love what Bill Johnson says. I love this quote by Bill. When he says, salvation is free, maturity is optional. To mature will take work. This isn't like a one-off thing. You don't get in shape by working out one day. You wish that were true. <laughs> it doesn't happen. And so our lives, we have to put work, and that means to be in a state of discomfort. I was sure they got back. I was sharing with John here. I mean, I have calluses on my hand. I swung a pickaxe for two straight weeks. 
I did. I, I dug in this, in this, in this uh, square. <laughs> it looked like a rectangle. That was dumb as a rectangle. It was, but it was a square, four meter by four meter square. And it was, it was just ground level when I started. And we dug in 104 degree heat. And I, and I, I blisters and blisters upon blisters, and now they're calluses. Hard work. You know, you, you end up in that place. It means being in a state of discomfort. <laughs> You're in that place. What I love about this is that what they're saying is they didn't run away from their problems. Now, let me pass this on to you. One of the best books I've ever read, I've mentioned this before, but I want you to hear it. I, I try to look it over every year. It's that impactful to me. It's a book by uh, Henry Cloud, and it's called Integrity. And it's called The Courage to Meet the Demands of Reality. It's a great book. To me, it's life-changing. And in this, in this book, he talks about how people face problems. You know, many people run away from them. They, want to just not, they just don't want them. I, want to, I don't want to deal with my problems. And he, then he, so he's, this, the book goes on. He says he was consulting some business. And this business was very successful. And, he, and, he, he, and he, as he walked in this company, they had a room that they called the war room. And he go, hey, have a war room? <laughs> what is that about? <laughs> you know, so he, he was curious about it. He said, yeah, well, let's go to the war room. And he goes, wow, I'm going to see what this war room is like. And he walks in. And written on the wall of this war room is this phrase, no problems, no profit. He said, I, I stood there for a moment and I stared at it. And now 18 years later, I still stare at it frequently. It's forever etched in my mind. That's because it answered the question that I walked in with and has been one of the answers to explain the growth and success of so many people I've seen since then. The ones who succeed in life are the ones who realize that life is largely about solving problems. And the ones who get with that find much success. And the ones who can't don't. It's like they were willing, on, in, the, in the first move of God, 40 years prior, they went, we got a problem. And they learned to deal with the problem. What is the problem in your life? I, I, when, I, when I coach people, I, I'll, I'll try to say things like this. Where do you want to be a year from now? What does that look like? And people go, oh, I don't know. Then I say, okay, let's answer it this way. Let's get this way. What problems do you expect you have to solve in this next year? And they go, oh, I know what they are. And they can see it clearly. It also requires perseverance, right? That's the ability. It's in this race, right? You, they persevere. The ability to bear up under difficulty. You can't overcome anything without perseverance. I once, I once worked with somebody. He, he wasn't the most gifted. And, and he was criticized for not being the most gifted. I remember talking to him about it. And he said to me, he says, he said this. I'll never forget it. He said, I may not be the most gifted, but I can outlast anybody. <laughs> Sometimes that ability to stay with it is so key. And finally, it's discernment. You begin to look at things. And that's not right. doesn't hit me right. In my uh, final day, I had to the uh, honor in Jerusalem, I, I was walking by in the hotel, came back, and there was this guy, and uh, with one professor who was sitting there I knew from the trip, and dig, and, and uh, said, sit down here. And so I sit down, there's a guy named, maybe you know him, I didn't know him, his name was Lenny Wolf. He says, I want you to meet him. I said, okay. Well, it turns out, who, I guess he did his, uh, I think it was a PhD at Hebrew University, and here he specializes in antiquities. And he learns how to pick out forgeries in antiquities. And he had just testified in a famous case in Israel about how these forgeries were being brought. And he identified the letter bait and how it was formed improperly for the time period it was supposed to have been in. And he testified that this I mean, it's interesting. She was on PBS for the Dead Sea Scrolls. It was an interesting thing, like talking to this guy. He, he, you, you learn to discern what's right. 
You go, mm, that's not, that doesn't sit in my spirit right. I mean, you learn. And they were learning all this. And part of growing in your life is learning how to watch over your life. This is what Paul tells them on his final, when he finally talks to the elders as, he, as, as he's on his way um, to Jerusalem and eventually be arrested there. And he meets in Miletus with the elders and he tells them, watch over your life. I'm telling you, listen to me, listen to me, listen, listen, listen. The biggest challenge of leadership in your life is self-leadership. The hardest person, the most difficult person you will ever lead is yourself. Do I get an amen? <laughs> anyway, and they were energized by it. I mean, they were energized by it. That's the picture. Here's what you do. So you take your time, look at your life, you start looking at, you know, think of it. In terms of your walk with God, and everybody has something like this. What are you believing right now that is putting the spiritual passion out inside of you? Because there might be something that is just not helping you, that you're logging into. It's just false. Or what actions, what are you doing that is undermining your ability to love God more? I mean, these become the things we start to address in our lives. And we start to look at it because the call is to love God with our whole being. So we start to guard our lives and that becomes the priority. We want our hearts to be ignited. Which means we have to reset our heart, which is the next point. So we have to reset our heart. Look at this. You, uh, this I hold against you. You have forsaken your first love. And that idea is that, that when God begins to grow us up and do the things that we're, we're called to do, you can be involved in good activity. You can be doing a lot of good things. But you can lose your heart in doing it. You can, you can be really busy. You can be accomplishing a lot of important things, even things God wants you to do, and lose him in the process. You know, expanding with God never comes at the cost of intimacy with him. And that becomes the element of growing and walking with God through the years. This idea of forsaken is the idea of to abandon. It's like they forgot the most important thing. They're living for all the right things. That's wrong. That person's not teaching right stuff. And they're doing this wrong. And, they, they, and then we got to protect this. They, they got it all right. But they lost this first love. You know, some said this first love is the love with God. Maybe it's awareness of God's love for them. Maybe it's their love for others. It's, maybe it's all three rolled together. But their hearts were wandering. It, they, they went down the wrong path. That's why I asked you, on a scale of one to ten, where are you? Because if you're at a place where there was a time where you loved him more, it's time to get back to that. You start looking at this. Remember the height from which you have fallen. That, that's what he said. Remember the height from which you've fallen. The word fallen is translated in two different places in the New Testament in different ways. It's translated as withered in the book of James and 1 Peter. When our walk with God when our closeness to him begins to fade, our lives wither. And when churches lose that spiritual root, that spiritual passion, that he's the first, it's all about him, the church begins to wither. It's like it only flourishes in him. This is what Jesus says, right? Apart from me, you can do nothing. And it also means, it's used in the book of Acts, this word fallen, to describe the, the ship in the storm that's out of control. So it means, I, it describes 
how important it is, this priority, that when we put him first, the spiritual rain begins to fall. The land of milk and honey. God begins to provide in a land that's desolate and difficult and you're dependent upon him. If you put him first, God begins to bless. But if you lose control of your heart, your life begins to wither. And it's hard work. It requires careful study of scripture. It requires persevering. It requires growing. So there's a story of a famous rabbi, Rabbi Akiva. 40 years old, he was a shepherd, and he, he was thirsty. He's out, out in the field, and he goes to get a drink of water, and he's in, in Judah, and he goes out to get the water, and he begins to scoop the water to get refreshed, and he notices water dripping down to a rock, and he sees the rock. It's dripping on this hard stone, and where the water is hitting, it's changing the shape of the rock. He begins to look at his life. He's been challenged by someone he's fallen in love with to be a student of Torah, to study the word. And he realizes that how that constant dripping of that soft water on that hard stone had caused a shape in that stone. And that the constant drip of God's word upon his heart would change the shape of his heart over time if he allowed it to change him. Rabbi Akiva trained 24,000 people. At the age of 40, he began. He had to learn how to read. He had to learn the alphabet with children. Our lives, we begin to look at it and say, I, I want to grow. I, I, want, I want the intimacy with God, to, his word, to draw me close, that living word, to change me. Take the hardness of my heart and change me. To be willing to stay under the constant drip of God's word. So he can shape us. As crazy as this might sound, you know. Effectiveness. Effectiveness. Effective activity doesn't always indicate intimacy with God. And it's something that we have to always keep in mind. When Paul prayed for the Ephesian church, now it's 30 years prior to what we're reading in Revelation, he's praying for this very thing. I'm praying out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that Christ will set up, you will feel his presence inside of you, he will make a dwelling, you will be a habitation. I pray you'll be rooted and established in love. You will know his love. You'll grow up in love. You'll experience his love. You may have power with all the saints to grasp how wide, long, high, deep is the love of Christ. And to know his love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of the fullness of God. Everything flows out of intimacy. So in, in this trip, you know, uh, it's interesting, you know, so I don't want your picture of an archaeological dig. Let me t- just take it right off the top. It's not glamorous. <laughs> it's not. It's hard work. Get up about 4.15 in the morning, breakfast at 4.30. You're on the bus by 5.30. You're at the dig by before 6 o'clock, and you start digging at 6 a.m., and you work till noon. That's too hot. Some digs start at 5 a.m., work till noon. But it's just too hot to work in the afternoon. So I, I remember just, you know, uh, I have a picture, I think, of, of me on the dig here in the square. And I, I took this. I, I wasn't playing on sharing with the group, but I, I found it. Because this is the square that I helped dig. And that, that gentleman with the hat on back there behind me, he's one of the top New Testament scholars in the world. His name is Brad Young. In fact, he's just written, I encourage you to buy it. It's called The Newer New Testament, doing a translation. He's, he's, he's this PhD at Hebrew University. He uh, speaks fluent Hebrew. He's a tremendous scholar. Done a lot of work with Jesus and Rabbinics and worked with David Fleuser for years. I saw Brad walking up. I haven't seen Brad since 1977. I thought, is that Brad? <laughs> sure enough. For three days, we spent time in that square. So we, so we, 
we work, you know, we find all kinds of stuff. You find all things, but uh, it's interesting. But here's what struck me. I, I'm, I kid you not. So we get up at 4.15. I get up at 4.15, just get dressed and get some yogurt and granola. <laughs> I was in for the board at 4.30. And then, you know, you're on the bus. <clears throat> but before we leave, we would pray. And we would meet. And we overlooked. We're at Migdal overlooking the Sea of Galilee. It's gorgeous. But, of course, the sun wasn't even up yet. And it was just beautiful. And it struck me. It struck me that this was the atmosphere that Jesus prayed in. And Mark describes it. Mark described how very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up and left the house and went up to a solitary place where he prayed. And I'm, I'm looking around and I'm going, you know, we're a Migdal, we're sort of above Magdala a little bit, so we're not quite, you know, above Capernaum or a little bit from Bethsaida, not too far, a few miles. But I'm looking down, I'm up, we're up high, and I'm looking down to the coastline. This is the environment, and I'm realizing how beautiful, it's so beautiful. And I thought about this. Yeah, he, he got away from everybody to the quiet of this. And what's called, what I, many have called, the undistracted pursuit of God. His undistracted pursuit of being with his father. And in the stillness, you could, you could hear his voice. You could hear the father more clearly. To keep your heart always set, to always love him. See, God calls us back. It's like you want to say, I, I, I loved him more years ago, or I loved him. I, we want to reclaim that. We want to reclaim that walk with him. Prayer means to draw close to God, to be with him, to be close to him. I think there wasn't a morning I wasn't captured by that. Looking at the Sea of Galilee and in the dark and, and just seeing the lights and seeing the sunrise barely peeking over the Golan Heights and and just thinking about this, it's all about our closeness with them. We need that time alone. You and him. God began to move here. People would say, I can't believe it. My prayer time is so meaningful. I, don't, I, can't, I can't believe it. I sense this presence. I, I read the Bible and it's so alive. I, I don't know what's going on. It's It's God. It's the rain. It's the, if you love me, I'll come to you. If you come, if you come to me and seek with all your heart, you'll find me. People are finding God. And this is the cornerstone. Out of this, our lives sustain. And finally, the final point is we redirect our heart. Remember the height from which you've fallen. Remember where you were. Remember that day. He's saying, remember 40 years ago? He's telling them who were around. That, the church is blown up in Ephesus by then, by the way. It's it really exploding by the time John writes to it. But in the early days, God had moved miracles, signs. Remember those days. Remember where you were. Remember the height. Remember. Remember the time when you were so in love with God. Remember it. And repent and do the things you've done at first. Don't let it slip away. One of the sad, I was a young man, I was, I was 16, and I was so in love with Jesus. I'll never forget, I was in this church, and I was sharing my faith. We were going around playing guitar and testifying. It was wild. And, and this old man, who I he probably, and I guess this old man is now as old as I am right now came up to me, I'll never, ever, ever forget it. He looked at me and he said, crying, I remember when I was like you. But I'm not that anymore. Do you remember the height from which you've fallen? You know, it's, it's, it's living the way God wants us to live. Sometimes you have to, re, you have to rediscover your past to reclaim your future. And you begin to walk in that place that God has for you. Do the things you did at first. So, you know, sometimes 
marriage uh, counselors, I understand, do this. I'm not a marriage counselor. Um, but by the way, I will say that this week, Dawn and I will celebrate our 49th wedding anniversary, which is amazing. <laughs> I, I don't know how she's done it, honestly. <laughs> That's the miracle. Um, but you know, what they say is, so couples will come and they'll say, uh, I don't love them anymore. I don't love her anymore. Uh, so they get saying, okay, uh, tell me, why'd you, fall, why'd you marry them anyway? What, what did you... What did you love about them? And they said, oh, I loved this. They were fun. They, were, they listened. They, all kind of, they began to share. <laughs> then the counselor will say, why don't you go back and do the things you did when you first got married? Why don't you go back and do the things you did when you first got married? And what you learn is this. Actions Emotions follow actions. And we believe that actions follow emotions. When you begin to do the right things, everything starts to fall in place. That's what John's saying here. Do the things you did at first. Get back to it. Get back to it. Pray, get in the word. Let God begin to move on your heart again. And what amazes me in all these years of my journey with the Lord is how simple it is. It truly is simple. There's nothing like that for me in being alone with him. There's just nothing like it. I did it this morning, just get alone with him and journal. and It's just like it's the best. It's just the best. Look, this is the heart of it, right? This is the journey. What we're called to, and this church is what we've, it's been founded on it, where we've lived into. We thought, let's sort of live into this. It's about our walk with God. It's not about just us. It's about what God wants. It's about drawing close to him. That's why you see all the prayer ministries that we, we have. It's not because we just decide that prayer ministries. It's not because oh, we should be praying. It's like, no, because we need God. We want his presence in everything, with the physical problems we have, the emotional struggles of our life, to just basic needs of every day. To, it's about learning how to walk with God, because when we do, the promise is that when we love him with all of our whole being, that the land of milk and honey begins to open up. It begins to rain. We get to depend upon him. So look, um, as we begin this series, we're going to, you know, we're talking about the weeks ahead about how God used to change our lives and work in our relationships and used the power to change the world. But the heart of it is this, because it all flows from this. It's learning how to draw close to him. This reading of scripture, you understand tradition. It's not about having your devotions. John Wesley, who was the founder of the Methodist movement, and he's not the only one who says this, believes it's a means of grace. In other words, God comes to you when you open it up. When you pray, God imparts grace. When you open his word, it's a means of grace. When we gather together. So there's ways in which God imparts to our lives. So Lord... Let it rain. <laughs> Come Holy Spirit. So funny to say this. So we used to dream. Imagine if we had a church full of people who just loved, who loved God. Who want, they're not perfect, right? No one's perfect. But that's their heart desire, to draw close to them. Imagine if we had just 10 people. Imagine if we had 20 people or 30 people who wanted that. Imagine. You know what happened? <laughs> There'd be revival. Amazing revival. And lives would be changed and people would be touched and the world would be impacted because the heart of it all flows from this. Let's pray. So Lord, we just thank you for your love and for your mercy and that you just come to us in so many wonderful ways. We thank you for your promise over your word. We pray, Lord, that thank you for blessing the good things in our life that we've established. But Lord, draw us close. We pray that this would be our best season.
that this would be our, our closest time with you ever. That they will get better and better. We'll grow closer and closer to you. And from this, our lives will become more and more fruitful. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.